Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's nice to see you here. And as you know, we've been struggling through Daniel chapter 11, uh, creating this document with the historic application. Uh, we got it from Swearingen. This is, I just copied it from this book, but we've had to change some things because he interprets some of the historical evidence differently or fulfillment differently than we do. And we have to get the historical correct if we're going to apply it to our lines. So before we begin, can you join me in the prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do. We pray that your angels can watch over each person and that as we study together, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts. We're thankful for this study in Daniel chapter 11 and the things that we are learning. And we pray for all who are searching into these things and that you can guide and direct them. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So yesterday we, I don't know if I'd call it a breakthrough, but we definitely we, we have basically completed this whole line of Greece. We just need to, to draw it out. And we have some details here in verse 16. So the basic idea as we go through, um, when we went through Persia, we saw that Persia paralleled our history. And then we've been going through Greece and we can see it parallels our history. And then we will go through Rome and see that it parallels our history as well. Um, these very good reason to believe so. And that these, uh, each one of these is a different way mark in the line above, right? So we have some line above, which is Daniel chapter 11, the entire line. And that we haven't uh, really addressed how that looks. Um, but we have to assume that that's the case, that that entire line of Daniel 11 somehow uh, illustrates our history. So, so we have to figure that out. But right now we're working on the way marks within that line. And if we took um, Persia as representing a zoom into whatever that line is above, however it's structured, if we took Persia as a zoom into the first way mark on that line, um, whatever that, however that line looks, and then we would take uh, Greece as a zoom into whatever way mark on that line. Now I'm going to say that that what I would assume, still haven't shown this or demonstrated, that Persia would be a zoom into 9/11, that is the arrival of the second angel's message. Greece would be a zoom into what we would call midnight, and Rome a zoom into uh, the midnight cry. And then we'd have to say, well, what comes after Rome, of course, pagan Rome at first, and then papal Rome. Papal Rome would be a zoom into uh, the Sunday law. So if we're just taking that this is all about the second angel's message, even though within each of these way marks, we can create a line. So, so that's what we did with the book of Judges. So that's what we're doing here with this history. And um, some of the things that, that we addressed is we have to change uh, verse 16. And we have to add verse 16 to the Greek line, even though it's the beginning of the Roman line, um, because it's going to be the end of uh, the Seleucid Empire with Rome becoming the king of the north. Right, So that's what ends up happening. And then we can see how this will parallel with our history. Um, so we still have to deal with some of the details about the chosen people, who those are, and neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But before we completed that, we brought verse 16 up to this section because it had originally been in the other section. Uh, we brought it here because we saw that we had 
uh, Rafi and Paniam, but we didn't have the Sunday law. So we needed the Sunday law. We can see that that's going to work. Um, so, so let's go to this, these verses. We're going to read verse 15, and then we're going to try to finish off verse 15 and verse 16. That's what we're going to try to do. So hopefully, uh, um, this is making sense to people. So the king of the north, Antiochus the third. So we're saying this is the republicanism of the U.S. So, so applying it to our history. But in this history, um, Swearingen had placed this as Antiochus the fourth, and he was going to take that history of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the fourth, um, uh, and place it here. But we say that this is. We agree with Uriah Smith that this is about. Um, Panean. So he shall come. So we're saying this is 200 BC, circa 200 BC. There's different views about when Panean occurred. But we have symbols that attach this to April 5th, 2030. And what were those symbols that attach this to April 5th, 2030? Why, why did we do that? It's not in this verse itself, right? It was in the preceding verse where it talks about, and in those times during the Fifth Syrian War, there shall be many. And so what we had done is we had added these words, um, uh, those times. Uh, so those H1992 times H6256 and many H7227. We added them together and they gave us this number, 15475. Now, that is, we already had the number 14757. That's the period of time from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. And so we had had that from uh, the preceding verse. So we've had uh, that symbol there, uh, after certain years, we did a mathematical calculation that allowed us to see that. And then we took, and in those times, there shall be many. We took that and we saw that the difference between those numbers was 718. So July 18. So we have July 18 as a symbol in there that ties it to our history. Um, but we have, it's tying it, July 18 symbol to April 5th, 23rd. So that's why we're saying that uh, this battle of Paneum we're attaching to April 5th, 2030. Now, maybe that's not the best way to do it, uh, but the reason why we're doing it that way is it's a date that we have and, um, you know, maybe it's earlier. And remember, this is not a prediction of Paneum on April 5th, 2030. It's simply a symbolic date. And we're saying that Raphia, which is midnight, has not yet arrived. And we have the symbolic date that's derived from these. And we're going to say, well, that's that's what's going to be marked. Paneum. So that's why we put April 5th, 20. Now, maybe that Paneum comes sooner. So we might change that once if we had some, some evidence of that after the event. But for now, we're just putting the date, April 5th, 2030, as, as a symbol of Paneum. And she'll cast up a mound. So this we look at as being persecution and she'll take the most fence cities. So um, of Judea, that is particularly Sidon. And we're saying that this represents, because you have Tyre Sidon, Tyre is the papacy. Sidon would be the apostate Protestant churches. So Tyre and Sidon are often mentioned together, 10 miles apart. Uh, I think it's 20 miles, something. They're, they're fairly close together. And the arms of the south, so that, that would be the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, um, we're saying that this represents the radical left. Shall not withstand. Now, the word withstand also is translated mostly as stand up. And so that they're going to lose this battle of the knee, this ideological battle in our history. It's not an actual battle. And then it says, neither his. Now, 
if this is Rome's or the papacy's chosen people, that would be in accordance with Uriah Smith, saying that the chosen people there are Scopus and others. And neither shall there be any strength to withstand. And we know, of course, that word withstand again is stand up. So, um, and we, and so we have some things there that we have to decide on and really decided on and, and then how they would apply to our history. So if it says neither his chosen people, you have to remember in Hebrew, it's not very clear who the personal pronoun is referring to. Um, and, it, and it's really all one word, uh, the chosen, well, the chosen people. That is, his is not in uh, the Hebrew, right? It's part of the word itself. It just um, would be part of the grammatical structure of the words themselves. Um, So the people of him, uh, and let me see if I can find this here, how that, that goes. So when we look at chosen, neither his chosen, in the he in the King James, there's three words, neither his chosen. Um, but there's just one Hebrew word, the word chosen. And this word chosen in Hebrew in that verse. Um, Is that the Hebrew word mibkar? Uh, yeah, so it's um it's uh, mibkar, yeah, mibkar or mibkar. Um so I'm just looking at the form of the word. So it just, um, yeah. So the way that they put the word mib, car, uh, um, let me see here. This way. How is that, how is that different from bakar? From bakar? Yeah. Um, Okay, which is bakar? Which word is that? Which which is it here somewhere? Well, we're looking at this portion of the verse where it says, "Neither his chosen people." Right. Which, depending on what part of history or part what part of the Hebrew we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. The translators could have used the people of his choices. At least that's what I see in the 1769 Bible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, I mean, the word, it's masculine and it's a plural. Um, it would be, uh, mib echar. Kariv, Mika, Kariv, uh, just because it has the, the Vav at the end. Um, and so it's masculine plural. And, um, so it, it doesn't really have the word his in here. Cause even though the word's masculine, it's not possessive. Okay. It shouldn't be really the chosen of him, the chosen people of him. Now, uh, and then it says, um, Right before that, like, oh, I guess the people is, is his. So that's going to be, uh, um, va'amadu. So that means that's the possessive. That's where we get that it's his, um, verb. So it's a masculine plural, uh, imperfect, um, which is weird because that means it's, it's a verb. The people is a verb, not a noun. Which is odd, right? I mean, I guess we could say in English, you know, you could people something and that would be a verb. Um, but pretty bad English as far as I'm concerned. You know, let's, let's people this party, you know, let's fill it with people. Um, so, so it's odd that you see this word, uh, um, let me see here, low and that doesn't even make sense. Ah, so I'm looking wrong. So that's, I'm looking at the wrong word here. 
So ya amodu, that's not the right word. Ah, there we have nation people. That's am. So they both have am. I was looking at this wrong. Okay, so this is a masculine singular noun. People, uh, the choicest people. So it doesn't actually have his chosen people. That's that's the point, I guess. Right. And, and not, uh, and they shall not stand. Um, and the choicest people. So it doesn't say his chosen people. It says the choicest people. So the choicest people doesn't, it doesn't say it's any people of anyone's, just the choicest people. Um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, uh, so, and, and nothing, um, <clears throat> And nothing strength uh, uh, to endure, which is uh, which is going to have uh, the lamed in front of it, la amod. Okay, so I see. Um, so that's strength stand. Okay, okay. I'm just learning some things here, dealing with these forms of these words. So if we look at um, So if we look at this sentence, so I'm going to try to put this together. So um, so the arms of the South shall not withstand. And then it doesn't. And then it just says. Uh, the people the, or the cho the choicest people. Now, it must imply that the choicest people are not going to stand, right? Because it doesn't have anything there as a verb. It just has the choicest people. That's all it has. It doesn't say neither his cho choicest people or neither uh, his chosen people. It doesn't say that in here. Just says the choicest people. And, and, and even then, um, you know, it doesn't really say the, right? It just says, uh, they, uh, and none shall st uh, stand before, let me see here. And, and the arms of the South shall not stand, right? So that's what it says. I'm just looking here again. Shall not stand, okay? And then, oh, and then it says, and, People of choice or people the choicest. So it has a vav there in front of, of the word people. And that vav is usually translated and. It's not always translated. Um, so, so they shall not stand and the choicest people. So we need a verb if you're going to have the choicest people mentioned. Now, they're putting there neither the choicest people. That is, they're connecting it to them not being able to stand. Okay, now. Yeah. I'm having a little heartburn over this on the chosen people being mm -hmm. connected with Rome's chosen people. Right, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it's Rome's chosen people. All right. Because right? when when we're looking at and examining Scopus, mm -hmm. there are two Scopus that stand out in history. One is an architect and is, is also an artist. And the other Scopus of Ayatollah, of Ayatolia, is a general. So I think that we're, we're speaking of Scopus of Ayatolia. Yeah, yeah, it's Ayatolia, yeah. Okay. The Ayatolian. Now, he was, he was noted for his service in the social war in Greece between the Ayatolian League 
And then he was notable with Ptolemaic Egypt because he was sent by Ptolemy to Greece to raise chosen soldiers. He raised 6,000 chosen soldiers to be used by Ptolemy against the Seleucid Empire. Okay. So you're saying uh, to, uh, Atolia? Correct. Okay. Well, I'm saying that it probably doesn't refer to that at all. I'm just I'm using really that about, as about because I'm saying this isn't even about chosen people. It's about the choicest people, right? It's not so much people that are chosen. It has to do with the choicest. Now, we know this word um, in Isaiah 22, verse 7, it's translated um, as choicest. And in that verse, it says, it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots. Now, there, it actually has a different Hebrew number in my Esword. So, so it's obviously garment so it's it's a typo in the Esau it has a typo. So it's it's not four zero five five as Esau it shows. It's four zero zero five. But I thought that was kind of odd that it had this typo there. Um. Now what verse so, was that that had four zero five five? Uh, twenty two seven in Isaiah. Okay. Right. So if you look at it on your e-sword, you'll see it says 4055, but it's actually 4005. Um, it's choices. So Isaiah 22, 7. And, and it's also in Jeremiah 22, 7 as choice, right? Um, where it talks about the choice cedars. They should cut choice cedars. So now it's translated as chosen in um, uh, the chosen captains in Exodus 15.4, Jeremiah 48.5, uh, where it talks about um, his chosen young men. This would be, again, choicest young men, right? It's not so much that they're chosen, but that they're the choicest, right? They're not just some people that are chosen, but they're they're the choicest, right? That makes sense. The difference. I'm, I'm not struggling to understand the difference, but I mean it's a very fine difference. Yeah, it is a fine difference. But you can say there's some people that are chosen to do some. They may not be the choicest, right? Okay. So the idea of the choicest here, to me, is a little bit different than just being chosen in the sense of. For no particular reason other than, you know, they're going to be the ones to do something, you know. Um, so when you talk about cutting down his thy choice cedars in Jeremiah 22, 7, you can see that that's not just cedars that are chosen to be cut down. They're actually the choice cedars, right? The, the ones that are the best. They're chosen as the best. Does that make sense? Okay. So chosen, I we, think we, is, is better translation. All right. So the, you know, the choices. In, in this situation, we also have three sets of passages with four verses out of Ezekiel, which visions are being referenced out of this? Um, well, it's going to be um, uh, the uh, these visions dealing with uh, the siege of Jerusalem, and then you're going to have Egypt, and you're going to have uh, um, Ohola and Oholaba, right? That and so there's one, two, three. I only have three. Where's the fourth? You've got Ezekiel 23, oh. 7, 24, 4, and 5, 
And okay. then part five, I see what you're saying. Two verses in in the story of the siege of Jerusalem. Right. And then right. you've got 3116. Yeah, gather the pieces thereof into it. Every one, every good piece, the thigh, the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones, which would mean the choicest bones, right? Right. Take the choice of the flock. So it's not just choose something from the flock. You're bringing the best of the flock and burn right. all the bones under it and make it boil well and let them seize the bones of it there, therein, right? So this, this shows that this has to do with choices. So to say it's the choicest, the people that are the choicest, to me is much different than just saying the chosen people. And, and to place that then as Scopius, that they wouldn't be the choicest people. They're just people that were chosen to do something. But they're not the choicest from among something else, right? Because this is from among something else, you're bringing the choicest. That's what the word means. So, so there's a little bit of difference there that I think is important, even if it's a subtle difference. And to say neither his chosen people when neither his is not in there, it's it's not really, I don't even think, implied. And then when we look at neither, neither shall be there be any strength to withstand. Um, well, that word is in there, but that word is, it's um, structured differently. So, um, so to try to attach that neither which is there once to place it there twice doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the idea then is uh, just basically, and it, to say that it's translated as neither is not really the best because it just means it does not, there does not exist um, strength to stand, right? Or to stand up. So there's no strength to stand up. That's the idea of the verse. And I don't think that that fits to say this is about Scopius, right? Or Rome's, uh, the one that Rome has chosen. So we have to figure out what that means, how we would apply that. So the arms of the South shall not stand up. And then it just says, and the choicest people. Neither strength to withstand. And it could be, you know, that you could say, uh, and neither the choice, the choicest people had strength to withstand. Right? You could put it all together that way. But then you'd have to figure what, what, what is the choicest people here that don't have the strength to withstand? which is what I think it would more likely best way to translate it would be. The choicest people neither sh neither shall, they have strength to withstand. And if we translated it that way, we'd have that the power of the king of the north, that even the best people are not going to be able to withstand it. Right. They're not going to be able to stand up. And the idea here that we stand, stand up, that is the king of the south um, are not going to be able to stand up. So even though they come in and they sort of win this battle of of Raphia. Right. When it comes to the battle of Paneum. They're not going to be able to stand. Right? They're not. They're not going to rise up. They're not going to establish a kingdom. Right. So when we're applying this to uh, what happens with this battle of Raphia, um, there's going to be all this um, damage that results after Raphia occurs that is atheistic communism 
is not going to be able to set up its kingdom. So then we have the Battle of Paneum. And the Battle of Paneum is a total devastation of the plans of atheistic communism. Now, atheistic communism isn't destroyed. It just isn't able to set up its kingdom. Because it's going to be part of the threefold union that's going to happen. And so when we look at this history, how did this unfold? You have the Ptolemic Empire and you have the Seleucid Empire. And then you have the papacy. And the papacy exalts itself to establish the vision. Right? So we've established that. So what happens to the Ptolemic Empire and the Seleucid Empire? Do they still exist? No. Okay. Now, I mean, they still, Egypt still exists as Egypt. Uh, and it's going to be involved later, right, uh, with uh, Cleopatra and stuff like that. So if we look at um, so the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic kingdom, um, so it's going to be technically disestablished in 30 BC. So what disestablishes it? This is according to Wikipedia. So what disestablishes um, the Ptolemaic kingdom? Ptolemaic kingdom. It's going to be later in Daniel chapter 11. So this is going to be um, Caesar Augustus, Cleopatra. Right, so you got Julius Caesar. So what happens? Anybody give us a summary of, of what 30 BC has to do with the fall of the Ptolemic kingdom? Cleopatra comes into league with Rome. First, right. by her dalliance with Julius Caesar, and then right. by her dalliance with Mark Antony. Right. Okay. So, and we have the Battle of Actium, right? Okay. So, so that would mark the end of it, end of the Ptolemic Empire, according to Wikipedia. That's how they mark the end. And that's going to be later in Dan, right? We're going to have the Battle of Actium there. So that seems, uh, um, Valid, right? So, so there still is this ideology that exists, right? If we look, if we apply it to our history, because we have the dragon power, it's still going to exist in the form of the UN, but there's an ideology that the UN has, Right. And that ideology still will be there in the threefold union. Everybody is involved in this union because of their self-interest. Right. These different ideologies are the people connected to these ideologies. So we know that atheistic communism, whatever what you want to call it, has to also be involved in placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. Right. They have to be involved in the Sunday this religious Sunday law. Obviously, they're thinking about their personal goals, and they've lost to um, the apostate Protestant churches, right? They've lost to, you know, apostate Protestantism. Okay. So when we look at this, obviously, we're getting Rome's, we're not going to say Rome's or papacy's chosen people. We're just going to say uh, uh, the choicest people. Right? And we just don't use this at all. Oops. So the choicest people... What happens to them? Because it just mentions it. So we would say that they also don't stand up. Now, would the choicest people be the elite? You know, 
you, you know what I mean by elite. So what are the elite? If if are the elite what we would call generally the choicest people? What does the word elite mean? A select group that is superior in terms of ability or qualities to the rest of a group or society. Would choices people be a good way to describe the word elite from a, the English word elite in Hebrew, the choicest people? I'm wrestling with that right now. Okay, because if we think about the elite, those would be the World Economic Forum, right? Okay. Those are the elite, right? These business and political leaders and celebrities even. These are what they consider the elite. And they believe the reason why they like atheistic communism is it can put them as the ones who decide what's best for everyone else, right? Isn't that really what the World Economic Forum is about? Taking the elite, the choicest people, and making them the decision makers instead of a democracy. So this fits in, if we just use that word, the choicest people, they're not going to be able to stand. We can easily apply it to this battle here between these ideologies. So to me, this makes much more sense than trying to apply this to Scopus and and the others that Rome has chosen. And if we take it that way, way, then we can say, uh, we could have said neither the choice in the choices people, there's no strength for them to stand or to stand up. That is, the elite is not going to stand up. It's not going to become the predominant power in the world. Instead, the U.S. is. Apostate Protestantism is going to be this predominant power because it's the one that's going to make the image to the beast and cause all the world to wander after the beast and his image. So this is quite a bit different interpretation of uh, this passage from any that I've seen, but it, I think it makes the most sense, especially when you apply it to the battle of Paneum as an ideological battle in our time. So, and we had done a study on the World Economic Forum. And I believe that the World Economic Forum is not the threat to to us. I mean, it's a threat. It destabilizes society. Uh, But they don't have enough brains to actually implement their plan because one is it's a foolish plan. It can't work. You know, even if you had AI, you can't control uh, the economy and people. People are still going to act in unpredictable ways. Right? They're not going to act the way you can try to manipulate them all you want, but people act irrationally. And sometimes rationally when you want them to act irrationally, if you know what I mean. So, so then we can take neither shall there be any strength to withstand. That is as we have noted earlier, to stand up. Right? So there's going to, not going to be any strength to stand up. And, and so what would that mean in that history? That this, this, now, would we say, so one is we can say the choicest people, the elite, that uh, they shall not stand up. And, but then it says, neither shall there be any strength to, to stand up. Now, are we going to apply this to the choicest people? Um, or are we going to apply it just to the whole ideology itself? That is the arms of the South, um, the radical left. Why, why do they have this? You know, they say, um, the arms of the South shall not withstand, right? Shall not stand up. They could have just said that, but then they say his choicest people or the choicest people, the choicest people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. 
Well, it sounds to me <clears throat> like strength is talking about power. They, yes. They lose their power to stand. Right. So, so we know the United Nations, what its goal is, right? I mean, it wants a one world government. But there is not a one world government under the United Nations. What we have is the United States, the UN, and the papacy forming a threefold union to create a one world government. But that's not under the terms of the UN's ideology. Right? Would you agree there, Dana? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so that in order for them to, none of these powers stand out. I mean, we could also say that, in a sense, the United States doesn't really stand out. But this is more referring to the king of the south. It doesn't have any strength to stand up. But he, pagan Rome, that cometh against Seleucid Syria, shall do according to his own will. And none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So we can see here that pagan Rome comes in, and it is going to be able to stand. And it's going to stand in the glorious land. So all of these kingdoms stand up at different times, right? You had, you know, Medo-Persia stand up, right? Greece stand up. All these different kings standing up. People are always standing up, right? Uh, but this king of the south in the Battle of Pinium, it doesn't stand up. And I don't think uh, the king of the north stands up either. So... We could say that even though the king of the north conquers the king of the south, that when it says neither shall there be any strength to withstand or to stand up, that could be referring to the king of the north as well as the king of the south. Because pagan Rome is then going to come in and it's going to stand up. Right? And we're going to we're going to mark that at 191 BC when it shall do according to his will. Now, if we're going to apply 191 BC, um, then we just had the Battle of Raphia, the Battle of Pneum. Now, 191 BC, what is its characteristic? There's some characteristics. Well, at 191, of course, you have Rome coming against Greece. Right. And the characteristic of that is it's the exact center of the 62 weeks. Right. Right. So so it has a characteristic of, you know, it's midway, but it, it's... It's a hinge. Okay. So it's a, a hinge. Point. Yeah. So... Well, I'm going to say it's midnight. Okay. Okay. Now, when we talk about this, what I'm saying is that this history here is a focus upon the way mark of midnight. That is, if we are looking at the line above, we're going to say that this is, you know, all of this thing about Greece is midnight. And so we're zooming into that way mark of of Greece, which is midnight on the line from 9-11, midnight, midnight, Christ, Sunday line. It's the midnight way mark on that line. If we take Daniel chapter 11 and we draw it as a line, Greece is the midnight. We've had lots of symbols of midnight in this line. Um, so we can see that this points to this idea that all of this is symbolizing this midnight on this bigger line above. But it is including events that occur after midnight, right? Because when we zoom into a line, we're zooming into a waymark. I mean, we create a line, and that line will, con will contain waymarks that are earlier than that waymark, 
and events or waymarks that are later than that waymark, right? Because it's going to illustrate the entire line, right? And that's what I'm saying that, that Greece is doing. It's illustrating midnight. It's the waymark that we're coming to, and it's illustrating that waymark. But it illustrates it all the way to the Sunday law, because every line is going to lead us to the Sunday law. So it's going to illustrate that. But I'm just saying that 191 BC is 217 years prior to Christ being baptized. And it's 270, 217 years after the ending of the first seven weeks, right? So it has this characteristic of midnight because it's 217 and 217, a doubling, right? And the doubling is the symbol of July 21st. And we know in Millerite history, midnight is July 21st, right? Midway right. between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month, which symbolizes Sunday law. So we have to say that there's no way that we could take away this symbol of midnight from 191 BC. It has to be there. Right? There's just too much evidence to say it's not midnight as, as a symbol. Okay? But here it's also marking the Sunday law, right? This verse is marking the Sunday law. But midnight is technically halfway between the first day of the first month and the Sunday law, right? That's characteristic of midnight. Um, but it's illustrating that. It's illustrating midnight. But it includes the Sunday law, right? Because midnight points to the Sunday law. So when we have Seleucid Syria, he, pagan Rome, cometh against him Seleucid Syria. Well, we would have this as being the USA, right? That's how we've, we've done this. United States. Now, now here... We, when we talk about it being the USA, um, that's always such a broad way of looking at things. But, because it includes lots of things. Now, so he comes against him and shall do according to his own will. Right? So we put 191 BC there. That's when that happens. And this is midnight. Now, he does according to his own will. We're not really showing what that is, other than putting the date there. So the date is uh, the Battle of Thermop Thermopylae, right? Correct. Um, but when he does according to his own will, this brings us to the other places where he does according to his will. We see this with Alexander the Great. We see this in verse 16. And we see it in verse 36, right? So do we, and, and we also see that in Daniel chapter eight in connection with, uh, Media Persia. It does according to its will. And we say that this doing according to its will, because it first starts with Media Persia, has to do with its laws, right? Correct. Right? So it has to do with its laws. It's not just, you know, it does what it wants. It's actually has to do with its, its system, its legal system. So when it's going to do according to his will, this is the papacy's will in bringing about the Sunday law. He shall think to change times and laws, right? Correct. Okay. So if we, understand this then and we look at none shall stand before him um, we would have to say um, the papacy um, uh, I was going to say like implements the Sunday law but really the papacy gets the Sunday law Right. It uses the United States to do this. Right. 
And he, pagan Rome under Pompey the Great, and this is the papacy, shall stand in the glorious land. Right now, we put uh, when he stands in the glorious land. Um, we're going to say that this is 63 BC. Right, that's going to be the siege of Jerusalem, where Jerusalem comes under Rome's uh, power, right, fully. Right, Jerusalem does. Prior to that, they, I mean, they had a league nearly a hundred years earlier. But now they're going to come under the power of Rome through this whole process of what has happened. They had independence for a long time, but now uh, from Greece, but now they come under the power of Rome. And so uh, the papacy, and we'd have to say that, that this standing in the glorious land, Judeo Palestine is what it is here. Here it's the USA, which by his hand shall be consumed. So we know that's in 64, 63 BC. Right. So maybe I could take this out because we kind of have it there already. Um, so what does it mean by his hand shall be consumed? We know that the word here, um, H, is that word in Hebrew. And, and this word shows up when those that escape out of his hand, right, in chapter uh, 11, verse, whichever verse it is. I think it's 44 or something like that. But we also know that he stands in the glorious land, right? When we go to uh, Daniel 11, verse um, um, no, it's going to be verse uh, where is it here? It's actually verse 41 that they escape out of his hand. Um, um, so um, he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So if you compare, compare this with verse 41, you have the glorious land as well as um, uh, escaping out of the hand, or as well as the hand there, right? Many countries shall be overflown, overthrown. The other thing uh, that we see in this verse is um, we have the glorious land and we have his hand, right? So we have those two things. Now, when we look at the word hand, or or it's three zero two seven which symbolizes the 273, March 27. But what about the word land? Because we have that word all through the Bible. It's 776. Now, what's the significance of 776? Beside the fact that it's one short of 777? Well, it's connected to the fact that it's one short of 777. In the seventh year, in the seventh month, in the sixth day of the month. Right. That's Ezekiel. Chapter eight. Right. OK. And then we know that it's going to end on the seventh day of the month, that vision. Right. So it has a seven, seven, seven there. We also know that if we count from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991, that it's 776 cardinal days. 777 ordinal days. In our history, uh, that same span of time, uh, November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, is 777 days, cardinal days, right? So the 776, this Hebrew number for land, even though it's a very common word, it has this symbol attached to it. And when we put it together here with the glorious land, and which by his hand shall be consumed. We have land and hand put together. Um, we can see that that's giving us that 7-7 seven, seven structure with the message to the Levites. Now, what about the word consumed? 
So I'll let you see what I'm looking at here. So the word consumed has uh, the Hebrew number 3615. Anything about that number? Can we take the six and rotate it so it's a nine? And get 3915. Or is that stretching things? That's interesting. Okay. Because we have flipped over sixes to be nines. Okay. So if so if we say that this is also the symbol of the 391 and a half. That's going to be the period of time that leads up to the beginning of the 777, right? That's how we got to November 9th, 2019 as a confirmation. Okay, so so we have symbols here uh, that attach us to um, to this. So it attaches us to our line. And that brings us to the Sunday law, right? So it, it's it's all tying into the Sunday law, right? In our time. It ties us to Daniel 11, verse 41. Okay? So we would say that this next part, once we still deal with, with Rome coming in, uh, that's going to be a new line. Now, how do we then, so we have this now, so we can sort through that. We, I think it's pretty solid. We, we obviously will notice more detail as we go through these lines. Uh, oh, you don't want to look at that. Samuel Snow's letters there. Um, where we want to go to. Okay, so we had these different lines. Here's the one we want. So this was the line that we were working on dealing with Persia. And um, it brought us up to December 25th, 2023. But we're saying that, that this line here symbolizes more than this. So so if we're going to look at this line here of uh, dealing with uh, the first part of Greece, the breaking up of the kingdom, it gives us these symbols. But we're saying that this line of Greece goes further. It goes all the way to the Sunday law. And that there is a repeat of history. And we have a date there, 300, 391 and a half days after December 5th, 25th, 2021. We have January 20th, 2025. So that's going to be this election. Right? That will not the election, but who's ever going to be president next is going to be president on January 20th, 2025. And so we have this December 25th, 2023 date that's witnessed to by all these numerical symbols. But we kept studying because Greece wasn't finished. So, so now we're, we're moving into events or dates that are after that. So we're going to have to create another line. Right. So this line is correct. It's just not the whole line. It's a zoom into something on that line. And more specifically, if we have this line of Greece, this must be a zoom into a way mark on that line of Greece, which I would probably say is midnight. But the line of Greece itself is midnight. So we're zooming into midnight, into midnight. But now we want to look at a larger line. So we should be able to take this line and create a larger line. What's this up here? It's, okay. So I'm just going to copy this. Uh, right. So I'm not getting rid of the slide. I'm just duplicating this slide so that we can use this as a template. So this is what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to draw out this line and see how it fits. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of all this. Get rid of some of this. Probably I can need all these. 
So we don't really know what this line is going to look like yet. We have a bunch of dates here that obviously are not going to be um, used. I don't know spans of time. We're going to have some spans of time in here. Um, so in this line itself, um, we're just simply going to start it with um, this history here. You have this 776 days there. So is that where we're going to start it? And if we're going to start it there in 1989, maybe this line starts at September 11th. Maybe it starts somewhere else. But I would just say it would start at 1989. And that September 11th, 2001, uh, is this formalization. So we're going to keep that. But it's going to have, it's going to have some different, different things about this line. So I don't know what those are. So let's, let's just, so that we have this here. We know that that's what we're going to be working on probably for a little while. Uh, this document itself, I think we should be pretty happy here. Um, right, so we've got this message to the Levites uh, that we need to put in here. So I'm just, just hang on. Can't see what I'm doing. I'm going back to this. So we get this message to the Levites that symbolized there and uh, consumed. I'm just going to put 63 just. Uh, whoops, I'm the siege here. And what does that siege represent? Let's just finish this off here. So this whole line is going to bring us through this whole history. So we have a line here, but that line isn't complete, right? So we're going to have a line that's going to go all the way from um, Alexander the Great, right? So verse 3, so we have the fall of that. Um but we don't have to go into detail. So we have that line already drawn. And we know that there is going to be this, uh, what happens with the fall of the Soviet Union. So I'm not, not sure how we're going to do this yet. But we can see we can just take this whole history and just group it together. So from basically um, verse uh So you're going to have verse uh, three to four being the beginning and verse five to six is going to be um, September 11th. So you're going to have this November 9th to September 11th, all symbolized by that history. And then we have this history here, seven to nine. So we're saying that this is going to bring us in to our history dealing with Biden, right? So so this history is going to bring us up to 9-11, probably actually where we should start, because um, this is going to bring us to 9-11, and then we're going to have um, the transfer of power from republicanism to um, wokeism. So I hope people can kind of see what I'm doing here. Even though it's all in my head. Um, <clears throat> so we have Biden. So that history then is the formalization. Now we have the empowerment. Um, so we have to figure out where the empowerment is. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, let 
Again, read a bunch of stuff here, but you'll see how it works. Okay. I probably shouldn't undo it here. I'm going to undo that. I need to leave this stuff down here. So then we're going to put the empowerment. No, I don't know. Um, so if we look at something like this, this is a line. We have an arrival, a formalization, and an empowerment of a first message. What is the darkness? What is the message? If we're going to take Greece as a whole. So I don't know if people know what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little dark on this one. Okay, so we're taking the line of Greece and we're saying that the line of Greece is going to go from 1989 to the Sunday Law. All right. Right? That is, it's kind of the first line that, that Jeff had, well, not the first, I guess it'd be the second. Well, originally what he had was, you know, the time of the end, the Sunday law, the close of probation. So it would be once he had um, 9-11, then he had the time of the end, 9-11 Sunday law, right? So it's that line. That's how Jeff saw the line. Let me move this stuff over a little bit more. Okay. So he saw the line as uh, a line leading up to the Sunday law. And so we want the same thing. We want a line leading up to the Sunday law. So. And uh, so this is the whole line of Greece, and we have a first message, and we have a second message, as we always do. Um, okay, so we're going to say the first message arrives in 1989, and and it arrives in the 776 days. So we'd have to understand what Greece is about as a symbol of being midnight, because that's what we're saying it is. It's midnight. And um, so if we draw it on this line, we need to know what the darkness is, and we need to know what the first angel's message is. So I, I know it's it's a little bit uh, um, vague at this point, but you'll you'll see what I mean. <clears throat> so what is Greece about? Because we've just we've talked about it. it's a battle between between the north and the south. So it's a battle between these different ideologies. But it's also ultimately dealing with the end of the United States, right? We know it's the end of the Soviet Union, but the United States is in a league with the papacy to overthrow the Soviet Union. So you have the king of the north conquering the king of the south, right? But the king of the south is going to move from the Soviet Union to the UN. And if we have September 11th as a formalization of something, of a message called the first angel's message, how would, some, what would how could September 11th be a formalization? Now remember, we've had September 11th as an empowerment of the first angel. We've had it as the arrival of the second. But here in this line, it's a formalization of the first angel's message. So what is that message that it's a formalization of in this line of Greece? We need to figure out what the darkness is. So we already have the darkness here having to do with the Soviet, the fall of the Soviet Union, but this one's not focused on that, right? This one's not, it's focused on something different when we draw out the whole line. And I don't know if that makes sense to people, but that means the line that we drew first was a zoom into this line. 
It's going to have some of the same symbols. But there has to be a darkness that precedes it. I don't know. Does anybody understand what I'm getting at? Conceptually, yes. But I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Okay. So, so one thing we know about this line is that it's going to, we're going to have the third angel's message arrive. And the third angel's message, in this case, it would help if I put some verses here. So I'm going to just simply do this. I'm going to say that this is Daniel 11, verse 16. Okay. Okay. So Daniel 11, verse 16, then, is the Sunday law, right? That's what we've said. So in this one, when the third angel arrives, in this line of Greece, it's going to arrive at the Sunday law. And I need more lines here. So it's going to, it's going to, uh, go to the Sunday law. I want it to be like that. Okay, this all has to move over. Now, I don't know if the January 20th one's at the right spot. We could do it this way. Uh, okay, but you, you still have the document up. You're talking oh, about the line. Oh, you can't even, you can't even see what I'm doing. Correct. Uh, okay, here we go. No, I switched. Didn't switch screens. So here we have this line. So you can see we have uh, 1989 to 1991, the 776 days. That's the arrival of the first angel. Then we have September 11th is a formalization of it. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. And then um, I don't know what we would put here as the empowerment. Um, we could say, you know, uh, 11 9, 19 is the empowerment of it, but I don't know if that's that makes sense because we haven't decided what the message is yet. But we have some message that's formalized and then is empowered. Now, if we look at if we put this here as the empowerment, uh, uh, this is um. Uh, Biden becoming the president of the United States. So this this means that this would have something to do with the UN. So that this is the transfer of this idea of, of the King of the South from the Soviet Union to the United to the UN, right? And it's showing the UN's power. Now the UN is Greece. Wouldn't it make sense that Greece is symbolizing the UN overall? That's the focus. Remember, Persia is symbolizing the United States, the presidents of the United States. But in this line here, this is about this battle over this, over the kingdoms of this world, which are controlled by the UN. But ultimately, the one that it ends up controlling these things is the papacy. Right? Correct. Okay. So, so the papacy is, is going to be the one that ultimately comes at the end. But we're going to see this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south happening in our history. Right. So that's how we're applying this to our history. We're not putting the historical application in here. We, we parallel it, but we just draw out our history. So. So we're saying that when the Democrats take over the United States. Under Biden. Uh, that this happens in a way that is. Um, definitely more than any other president. Uh, Biden is the most wokest, even though he's the most uh, mentally asleep, right?
We wouldn't even say Obama is as woke as Biden is. Right. Okay. So all of this agenda of the radical left are being pushed by the Democrats. Um, and and it and it's almost and it's really in a reaction to Trump, not, and not even Trump actually, just Trump imaginarily, right? Because Trump really isn't all of the things that the left has made him out to be, right? He's definitely not a racist. He's not a misogynist, you know, at least in the in how he acts as, um, you know, a businessman or as a politician, right? He doesn't have these attributes of being a dictator, right? He's a constitutionalist. He believes in individual responsibility. He believes in, you know, the power of positive thinking, right? He's not, he's not a religious zealot. He's obviously uses religious people, uh, you know, to get elected. And, and he's somewhat religious. If you call Norman Vincent Peale, you know, a Christian, then, you know, Trump would be a Christian too in that sense. But it's obviously apostate Christianity. Uh, it doesn't really have much in similarity to conservative, uh, Protestants, right? Doesn't have much in, you know, with the evangelicals, he doesn't have much in common with them. Though the evangelicals are becoming more and more woke too. So it, it's, it's a pretty messed up world. There, there's a lot of blurred lines between all kinds of things. But Biden is a reaction to that perception of Trump. And it's an extreme reaction. And it was probably seen as the way to get people to vote. Gonna have this leftist president. Um, so, so the election of Biden can be this empowerment of that message. Whatever that message is, so we have to really try to define it more clearly, but it has something to do with, uh, this ideology, atheistic communism that is defeated and we know that, you know, on December 20, um, it's December 26, 1991, we have, um, Gorbachev resign. Now he's going to become a part of the UN. I can't remember exactly what he does in the UN, uh, but he becomes part of the UN. So, so in a sense, that head moves to the UN, right? Where we looked before, Jeff was saying, well, it comes, overflows and passes over and comes up to the neck, right? And so the head would be Russia. But if we look at the head is actually the king of Russia, which was Gorbachev, he still survives and he moves from the USSR to the Soviet Union or the USSR to the UN, right? That makes sense? It looks logical. Okay. So we could even put in there, you know, December 26th and the 777 days if we wanted to. And then we see with September 11th, uh, what occurs is the formalization of that. And that is, we see that uh, the UN is empowered in a sense there. We had it in our other line. But here we're just going to say it's a formalization. That is, we have a document. That document is uh, the Patriot Act. And that Patriot Act, in a sense, is giving power to the UN. Even though it's a couch in the term of patriotism, it's just Orwellian newspeak, right? Nothing patriotic about it, right? So that's going to be this formalization. And then it's empowered when Biden becomes president. So the takeover of the United States um, by this globalist agenda uh, is empowered with Biden becoming president. And then we would have to decide what the second angel arriving is, what date or event marks that. 
And then we would need a formalization of that second message. And then we would need its empowerment. And then we would have uh, the third angel arriving at the Sunday law. So we're going to know, obviously, the formalization is raphia and the empowerment is paneum if we're going to have this as the Sunday law in the United States. So and I'm saying that we would. This line is a bigger line. Um, than the line that we have when we first drew Greece. So this is, we're, we're, we're zooming into that something on this line. Um, okay, is that kind of making sense here now, what we're going to do tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Because we would like to be able to finish up this line. Whether we can do it tomorrow, probably not. We probably won't because we'll notice more things. Um, but we definitely can take this line and um, say that it's pointing to something in the future. And that's why the other line just addresses our history. This addresses things that are still future and that we haven't, we, we haven't placed dates on, right? Because we can look back at the past and say, yeah, these dates did this. But when it comes to dates in the future, we don't, we can put symbolic dates there, but we can't put actual dates. Okay. Any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Just a lot to consider right now. Let's pray. Now, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We just ask that you can bring us together again to study these things. We pray for each person. We know the needs that we each have, struggles that we face. And we uphold one another in prayer. We ask that we can pray for each other um, throughout the day and throughout the week. That we can keep each each other in mind and the needs that exist. And um be with us throughout this day, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.